All right, welcome back to another Q&A. This is take two since last time I screwed up and everything was just wrong with the mic. I didn't turn it on. Here's the mic. And I can see the levels. There's a fan here because it's warm. You can see this going on. It should all be working this time. And if you're wondering what the hell is this channel, I'm JD. I have a YouTube channel that talks about animation. I do all kinds of lectures and rig reviews and product reviews, all kinds of things. And amongst those are also Q&As. And so feel free to browse around the visual pitch. Subscribe if you want to or not. Just follow the whole thing if you want to or not. Totally up to you. The Q&As are as such where I post on the phone. I'm doing a QA. and a Do you have any questions? And then I get all the questions. And in free form, this is like a half an hour to an hour where I just answer the questions in, in a very subjective way, obviously. And this is another part where I continue because there were lots of questions. So as always, I'm going to read out those questions out loud, obviously, so that if you only listen to uh, this clip, you don't have to watch any of this. You can still hear the question and you can hear my answers. So Malu is asking, hello, I'm new to your channel. So sorry if you have already answered these questions. No problem. Did you lose part of your passion once you started working as an animator? Is it easy to find a job in this industry? And what is the best way to learn about the industry? All good questions. And you would think that everything will be faster now that I'm going through this again. I'm also old and I forgot questions and my answers. It's going to be probably still a longer clip. Anyway, did you lose part of your passion once you started working as an animator? No, I would say the passion wasn't reignited. It, was, it wasn't lost, but it was like another level of passion just because you get to work with other passionate people. You get to see the behind the scenes, you get better tools, better rigs, at least at that time, schools, uh, you know, the school rigs compared to production rigs, totally different. And you get to see your shots rendered in a professional way. It's in movies and you watch the movies with friends in theaters, your name and credits. I mean, there's so much that goes around from being a student and then working as a professional where it was just so much better. So no, I didn't lose the passion. Uh, it was better. I mean, it was just, it was even better. Let's put it this way. Then is it easy to find a job in this industry? Uh, well, no. And yes, it depends. I mean, it's going to be hard. And my first round of demo reels, like no one answered. I got nothing. And then the second round, it got better. And it's mainly because my reel just wasn't good enough. The work wasn't good enough. So is it easy? It's never easy. And especially when I ask my students, my new semester started and I ask all the students, like, where do you guys want to work? Where, what's your dream company? And it's usually the top companies that come up in that list. And if that is your goal, then it is going to be hard because only the best of the best to some degree, work there. And the buddy always, you know, there's so many factors to go out of that. You don't have to be the best of the best. Sometimes you're the best, but maybe you're too good. Maybe your salary is too high and a company can't afford you. I mean, there are immigration issues, there's timing issue, budget issues, the crewing issues. There's so many things that are out of your control. So is it hard? Yes, because those things are out of control or out of your control. Uh, it's hard because there are a lot of people that want to do it. Um, but if you go for maybe a smaller company, you might have better chances. It's also hard if you are from a different country or even city, you might have to relocate. That's a problem. So I think there are many factors that can make it even harder than it already is. And at the same time, maybe you're really good and you, you live in the right city and everything is just aligned for you and you, you are in school, you get the internship and it's great. You graduate, you start there, the dream company, and then that's it. So many things happen where, where it's great for some people and really hard for, for other people. But I'm not going to say it's easy. Nothing is ever easy like that in this industry. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my answer. And what is the best way to learn about the industry? Well, it's a tricky thing because a lot of people don't talk about it um, because of fear of repercussions or they don't know or they're comfortable, they don't want to rock the boat. I mean, I would check online. Now I say this and like stick to comments, don't read the comments. It's always kind of like, really? You really want to read this? But I would look at our artists talking about it, either Instagram or Twitter or, or LinkedIn. Like, I know, probably not LinkedIn because it's more of a professional network. They're going to vent there. You might want to go on glassdoor.com to see the reviews, but then you might think there's a disgruntled ex-employees that want to vent. I don't know if it's as accurate as it could be. And you can go on sites like Cartoon Brew that will post things that maybe other publications don't post. There's a wage collusion scandal that happened years ago. Something just recently about what I was in the news about their work practices. Video game companies are oftentimes in news for it's trash day, by the way. Oh, it's a weirdly there's trash in this industry and there's trash outside. Yeah, it's, there's some stuff that happens where you have to kind of look for it, look at certain sites that will post those um, articles. Because again, not everybody does because of multiple reasons, repercussions, or they don't want to put too much negative light on things because they want to sell a positive product or view of the industry. So what is the best way to learn? 
Just look at what artists are saying. Always go through a filter of, well, how neutral is this point of view? What is their perspective? Do they gain something out of whatever they're saying? So it's a bit tricky. Dare I say, I'm not, I'm not super shy about things. I mean, I'm definitely also looking out that I don't get fired. <laughs> but every now and then, I mean, I'm not gonna not post about the wage collusion thing or just bad practices at work because you, you have to know. And I think if maybe follow me on Twitter and I kind of post things here and there or retweet things that are potentially not the nicest outlook or view of something. But again, as I, I tell my students that all the time, you gotta be aware of the pitfalls and the negative side of this industry. So maybe I can be of help, I don't know. But I would just look out for whoever artist is out, outspoken. Especially I think freelance people will be a bit more outspoken uh, about the current trends. But again, this is me talking out of my B-U-T-T, -T, so I'm not sure. Anyway, that's it. I hope that helps. Sleeping Giants, that is the username. Do you find yourself always animating left to right in the viewport, walk cycles, complex moves? I tried animating a drummer. The left hand movement is horrible because I'm right handed. Do you have a weaker direction or favor a dominant side? That is funny. And it was already funny last week when I first uh, read this first, but I do. I do have, I do go left to right. And I was just looking at a uh, walk cycle, no walk cycle, a bouncing ball assignment that someone did for my workshop, which I'm going to post today actually. And it was bouncing right to left and I flipped it. So it goes left to right. I'm definitely used to left to right. Not that I have control of that at work, like the shot is the shot, whatever direction it is, but I'm definitely, if I start something at home, I'm definitely, I think, inclined to go left to right. But then I'm thinking about some other shots that I did and I, there's still a lot of right to left. I don't know. I think my initial instinct is left to right. I don't know if it's because I'm reading left to right and the Western culture of things left to right. I don't know if that plays into it, but that's probably like my immediate answer would be yes, I would go left to right. Legion is the next one here. Got to expand this. I know you work very quick and efficient, I guess. Do selection sets, NURBS handles, work on newer versions of 2019 or 2020 Maya. The problem is most older versions of Maya do not retain a set because of the namespace changes every time a new version of the file is saved. This issue is killing my time. Did you find this an issue over the years? I did not, mainly because I don't use selection sets. This may be weird. And maybe, I don't know, you're watching this going, what? Uh, I don't know. I don't use selection sets. Uh, we have some really good tools that work. And so far I haven't had the necessity of using that to get into a faster workflow. So uh, to be honest, this question, I can't answer anything because I'm not using it. Sorry. Uh, Augusto Goicochea. I know this goes, even though I struggled last week already naming or pronouncing these, it's the struggle is real. Augusto, I'll leave it at Augusto. Hi. Hi. From the beginning, I always had the dilemma of how your rig determine your animation. I know the essence of animation is always done by yourself and nothing more, but sometimes when you have characters that doesn't are bipeds or they but have wings like birds. I'm just reading what I'm seeing here. I think that if you don't have a rig like the kind of that half in the big studios, your animation won't get with the same quality. What you think about, thank you very much. Love the movie analysis. Why, thank you very much, Augusto. Acting analysis and tips for animators on Thursday, highly recommend it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yes and no. Same answer I always as last week. The thing is, I think a really good animator is going to be able to take a crappy rig and do something awesome with it. So whenever I encounter a rig or do something where it's not great, my thought is, yeah, but I know someone and a couple of people that work really good. They would take this and it would be awesome. And I'll be jealous of the shot and I go, I wish I did this. So I think there is always a way to make it work. Yes, you might have to be a bit more technically inclined to navigate through some rig deficiencies, I guess. Um, and at the same time, yes, at the same time, you might want to do certain things and the rig is just not set up to do that. So you're going to have some problems where the facial stuff might not be as pronounced as you want it to be, or some elements in the body structure of the rig is going to prevent you from doing something, or just the way it's rigged will at least slow you down workflow wise. Yes, for sure. So to me, it's a yes and no. I think yes, it, it can limit you in certain ways. And at the same time, other people will probably find a really good way to make it work either way. And it's still going to be awesome. So yes, I would say yes and no. Isaac Ramirez. Ramirez. Highlander. For VFX animation, should the focus be creature animation and realistic movements? Well, depends. It's one of the most hated answers. Depends. Um, 
you might have some VFX companies that really focus more on, like you say, creature animation, realistic movements, where it's a bit more body mechanics and action and stuff like that. But then you have other companies, even though within the more realistic nature of, of where I work as well, you still have performance where you have creatures that have lip sync and they talk and they perform and they act. So I will probably still go with any type of performance, even though it's more on the realistic side. You know, think of all the Harry Potter creatures that can talk and stuff like that. I would still have something like that. Now, then again, I'm not speaking on behalf of recruiters, so don't take my word for any type of gospel, but I'm just saying, hypothetically, it's a hypothetic position where I would look at reels maybe and decide or look for something. Uh, yeah, creature animation would be cool. Any type of stuff with weights, camera animation and edits and anything that kind of represents or reflects the same type of shot work that the company would do. This is my uneducated non-HR, non-recruiter point of view. Um, but still, I would still look at anything that's kind of performance driven if you have a rig that supports that style, like a realistic rig. Leave it at that. Berserk Rage. Berserk Rage, all right. Hi, love your videos. Why, why thank you. I just wanna ask you why motion blur exists. Why do we need it? What if we don't use it in our 3D animation? What if we use it? Thanks, your videos helps a lot. Well, thank you for watching. I'm glad it's helpful. Uh, and why does motion blur exist? Well, because the way we see things through our eyes, I mean, I'm having a shutter here. It doesn't really work, but if you, if I do this, like my hand is blurred, it's just, you're going to have the blurriness of a fast move because your eyes are not, they can't fall. If you do this, I will see less blur. If I do this, I see more blur. Now you do this in a movie, you can, you can change all the camera settings. So it's, it's more like saving private Ryan at the beginning where you have more kind of a non-motion blur and it's just that kind of effect. I mean, you can use it for different styles. Why does it exist? Because it exists in real life the way we see things. Um, why do we need it? Because for certain movies you want to replicate real life and that's what you want to go for. And what if we don't use it? Well, then you don't use it. I don't know. I see lots of shots where there's no blur. It's kind of cool. I like it. I'm definitely used to it. I'm more used to the 24 frames a second staccato thing when you pan and, and the blur. I don't know. I'm not subjectively i'm not a fan of the the high frame rate look to me it's more like a i don't know digital camera soap opera style is not my thing um so i mean there are different ways of dialing in blur or not um do what if we use it and what if we don't use it just look at what is needed to present your work the, the way you want it to be and maybe it's better without blur and maybe it's okay with a little bit of blur maybe you need a lot of blur i don't know i think this is very dependent on what you want it to be and what you want it to look like like this i don't think there's a rule it's definitely if you want to replicate real life then it's going to be in there and if you're going to stray into more stylized uh work ah, maybe you don't need it it's such a non-helpful <laughs> answer catherine castrillo castrillo Caterine castrillo know, again i'm guessing here i assume the answer to my question may vary among countries okay but i'd like to know what to expect in a 3d animator employment agreement Things, oh yeah, remember this one. Things like working overtime and the rates, being able to include your shots in your reel, even if production gets called off. That stuff that as an entry level junior, you may not know, but that is really useful if you don't want to get yourself tricked. Right. Um, Sam answers last week, which no one heard because I didn't record the sound on. <clears throat> I can't really talk about the employment agreement just because I don't know if I'm allowed to because all kinds of NDAs and probably within the employment agreement is to not talk about the employment agreement. I think within every time I say something about like salary stuff, so I think someone comments that within the California law, you are allowed to talk about salaries. There's no legal repercussion. But I think in terms of other details, I'm going to not answer that question. Now, that being said, as you interview, I think those are things you should definitely ask. Like you say here, working overtime, what the rate is, can you include shots in your reel even if production gets called off? I say most of the times you can't. I think it's just a, a client thing of if it's not out there and it's vetted by PR and it's a public thing of this is the movie in theaters and DVD, Blu-ray streaming. Anything that's outside of that, that is like a, a deleted scene that's not included in the special features. I don't think you can show, but ask, I don't know, maybe the company, whatever client, whatever is around that project, maybe they have special permissions. I don't know, it's tough stuff to say, um, but yes. I would just make sure all the questions that you have, you ask when you are in a situation where you can ask like an interview process. So HR and everything, ask those questions. Do you pay over time? Uh, what's the race or quota? Do you pay moving? Is there moving incentives? Do you pay if they help me with the move? Is there like a signing bonus, blah, blah, blah. All those things you can ask there. Um, 
But again, I'm not sure if I can talk about my employment agreements and I don't want to get in trouble. So I'm not going to answer that. Sumaye Nagizade. I think so. Sorry. Could you please help us how to plan properly and precise, precisely? Can't even pronounce the precisely, precisely. How to use video reference exactly, how we can add things to it or remove parts of it. I mean, should the video reference be the exact reference we want or is it or it's not necessary and we can change it? I use the combination of video reference and thumbnails. Thumbnail and key poses are easy, but extreme poses like contacts, direction changes are hard to draw because you need to be precise to show the extremes. You know what I mean? It's hard to explain. In summary, it's hard for me to change video reference and don't know how to do it exactly. Any help would be appreciated. Thank you very much. It's good questions. Um, now, I did some some clips on my channel. I'm pointing here. There, that, no, that's my channel. Uh, about reference. But I do want to do another one where it's it's more demo-ish in terms of this is what I shot, this is what I filmed, this is what I'm getting out of it, this is what I'm keeping, this is what I'm deleting, this is how I put that into my scene. And then as I move forward, you know, the end result versus what was the original reference. Now, I want to do this. I don't want to do a, a, a many things in terms of demoing and things, but those like, hands-on things are always very time consuming. This is why it hasn't been super prominent, if at all, on my on my channel. Also, because this semester I have five classes, I'm so busy. And then there's there's daytime work, right? My main job and family. It's just it's very time consuming. So they always kind of pick certain things from my channel that are technically less time consuming. <clears throat> Hence the delay of my um, facial animation series and camera lectures, just because I want to go in there with demos and examples. It's just more time consuming. So. Could you please help us? Yes, I do want to do this and it's coming. No promises as to when. Tricky, especially right now because I'm super busy. That being said, how do you use video reference exactly? How can we add things or remove parts of it? I think there are many aspects to that. You should look at, are you going to act things out that really replicate the shot that you need? Meaning, are you acting things out with silhouette in mind and, and in a broad way, like where you're really taking what you acted out, you were acting in a very cartoony way, thinking about silhouette and the cartoonies and, and the stylization of it. Or are you just acting things out to kind of get the feel for it and kind of get some ideas and brainstorming some things and you might take some elements, but not exact poses, because then you're going to stylize the pose as you animate. So like that's already something. How is your reference being shot? Is it really replicating the shot in terms of the right camera angle, the right props? Is your character sitting at a table? Do you have a table there? Is your character talking to someone taller? Do you act it out like this? So that is, I think, the first step of many. You have to look at how do I shoot reference based on what do I need, right? Does it need to be a replication of, of or do you want to replicate the reference exactly? Or is it just kind of a, like an inspiration thing? Um, and in terms of adding and removing, also don't forget, you don't have to shoot reference once. Obviously shoot a couple takes, you get different ideas and you find the take. And then as you animate, you can always go back to shooting new reference, better ideas, a close up of details, or it just doesn't have to be a one time process or one time elements, right? Um, and you're using the combination of video reference and thumbnails. Like I don't do that because I can't draw, but I know many people who they shoot reference and like, oh, that's a cool frame. Let me thumbnail this moment, this pose, but then push the pose in the thumbnail because they're good at drawing, they can stylize things. And then they take that and put that into their, their animation. That's one way. You can also shoot reference, take the footage into Maya, rotoscope it, so it's faster and it's all there in the scene. And then depending on your style, you will keep more or less of your rotoscoped or you know motion matched reference. Um, I think there are many ways to go about this. I hope this helps. I hope this makes sense. Um, so my, if not, e uh, email me. Uh, leave a comment just in case you know if you need any clarification on that. All right. Next up, we have. Dirun FX, Dirun FX, Dirun FX. How long is the deadline for a big studio like Pixar or whatever? <laughs> it's made me laugh last time, last time too. Or whatever, you mean, or whatever. Um, well, do I do uh, answer the immediate thing here? Pixar, I don't know. I don't work at Pixar, I don't know. Uh, or whatever, I'm going to put myself into that whatever camp. And the answer is it depends. The most handed answer. It depends because you have one character, you have two characters. That changes it, right? You got a certain length of a shot that will change. I think how long is the deadline? The deadline is always going to be aggressive. How about that? It's always going to be shorter than you would like it to be. That would be my general answer. Because I always like to have more time to work on things and finesse things. Um, but you can't spend all the time. It gets expensive to keep working on things and blah, blah, blah. And also, you know, at one point the animation has to be done. 
So you can render it and you can do the compositing, all that stuff. So I think generally it's probably going to be more on the shorter side than you would like it to be. Um, aggressive in terms of getting it done and making cost effective. And I'm leaving it at that. I mean, you know, some shots are, are a day or two. If it's something really short, it can happen. And sometimes shots are weeks and sometimes it ends up being months. <laughs> so it's a very wide spectrum and I'll leave it at that. Malirizam. Malirizam, I think so. Hold on, there's a bigger one here. One, I see people on YouTube posing their character in a matter of seconds and they have no issues with gimbal lock. But for me, even though I take my time, hours spent on one pose, trying to animate one axis at a time, it still hits some gimbal lock. Euler filter or Euler filter doesn't seem to help much. The only thing I could do was manually reposing every frame. Mm, yeah, I don't know. I, maybe it matters also on how the rigs are built. I don't really run into gimbal issues that much at work, dare I say. I do use the Euler Euler filter uh, and that helps for crazy spikes. Um, so yeah, I'm not really running into those kind of problems, but sometimes you do have to go in there frame by frame either way, just because of the, the nature of the shot. So I'm not sure I have massive help here. Two, you got a second question here. How you should know that you're not cut for animation and you should just give up? Right, I remember this one. It's a totally different question. So how is it from a technical point of view and do you fail? Uh, how should you know that you're not cut for animation? You know, that's a, it's a tough one. And the way I think I remember answering the question last time was, it really depends how long you can stick with it and try to persevere and keep going because you might have the financial needs or, or you know, the elements in place to pay all your bills. And you might have another job where you can pay your bills and go through life and it's fine. While on the side, you keep working your reel to get into the industry. Make that could be one way, right? I know someone who worked, uh, who is now working at Disney and he took a ton of my workshops, a ton of other classes. And I think it took him five or six years. If you're watching this, I might be completely misremembering all kinds of the length of it. But I remember him trying hard and, and at the beginning, it wasn't this, the work wasn't that great. It got better. And then suddenly it clicked and it was so good where that was the last workshop that he took. And, and my answer was you know, like, this is going to be my, a matter of time. This looks great. I don't know what happened, but this looks so much better. So I think, I think for a lot of people, it, it just clicks, but I don't know when. I, I don't know how to make it click. And I see this in my classes where I see work, maybe there should be a demo at the beginning of the semester. And like, mm, you know, this needs a lot of work. And then half the semester, like, mm, it needs a lot of work. And then suddenly the next submission, like, what happened? This is so good. And then I ask, and usually the answer is, I don't know, it, it just kind of clicked. And then, and then we try to get to the bottom of this and, and we usually kind of figure it out. It just, something clicks and then the work suddenly gets better. So the long answer here is that how should you know I don't know. Like, I can't tell you that. Like, I don't know your situation. Is it, you know, like you might be in a different country and it's hard to immigrate into another country to work for that company. So the whole visa issues, work visa, that's, that's a thing. I mean, how long can you sustain that? Um, maybe you're also mean you are in the industry, you got a job and you realize the stress of the deadlines, client feedback, work environment, the culture, whatever you're exposed to, depending on you know, what side, gaming, VFX or feature, TV or VR, whatever. Maybe you realize after a while that it doesn't work for you. Again, I can't really answer this because it's my, my patience with this industry or a shot or work is going to be totally different. And, and the way I work through it and, and what is okay for me and what what needs to happen until it's not okay for me. Like our threshold is totally different. So I have lost like last time. I don't really have an answer for this. How should you know? I think just listen to your gut, listen to your heart. It's been corny, but just listen to how you feel like, like, or, and talk to people. Like, is this normal? And someone like, no, this shouldn't be like this. Examine your workplace, examine your situation. And, and, and again, you can only make that decision for yourself in terms of how long am I going to try to make this work? either to get into the industry or stay in the industry. Um, and that's something I think I'm just not able to answer. I think both of your questions I can't answer. It's a horrible Q&A. <laughs> Daira Vijay, Vijay, sorry. I'll read the question. Sorry about those names. How to animate realistic and cartoony body mechanics? Question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. Um, well, I mean, I told totally different things. Broadly speaking, I would say, 
I mean, realistic stuff. You look at reference. I mean, you want to replicate, act it out for yourself, film yourself, and you have the luxury of sticking to your reference more. I like to help. The reference is going to help you more. At the same time, you have less leeway in terms of doing something wrong in terms of timing and weight. Because if it's if it's rendered realistically and the timing is just ever so slightly off, it's going to look bad because it looks real but it doesn't move real. So there's a bit of a pro and con where you have. Like I said, the freedom of replicating the reference and copying it. It's like maybe it's quote unquote less work. It's not. But then the, the tricky thing is once you see the render, it just you have less freedom. Like this has to really work. Versus cartoon, I mean, feature work and, uh, you know, you have a bit more leeway in terms of your arcs and stylization and just it's less, you know, you have to have less dirt in your animation to make it photo real. Like usually stylized, less is more, it's better. So I wouldn't say it's easier. It's it's potentially easier from a, a technical point of view. Some people are going to roll their eyes. No, it's not. Just hear me out. I feel like animation for realistic stuff is, is harder just because, again, you have less freedom in terms of making it work because you know how things are in real life. And if especially with face stuff, it just ever so slightly off the uncanny valley. The animation dies. Like It's so hard to make that work. But at the same time, in realistic animation, it's not really that performance driven. Just talked about that in a previous question. There are some movies that have performance in it. A lot of times it's just rah, rah, fighting and rah, rah, roar, right? How many times have you seen this? It's not super, super challenging in terms of performance. It's just me saying this, you might totally disagree. It's my subjective view where I feel like in, in, in photo real animation, it's not as demanding in terms of the performance. Then going back to the cartoony side, I feel like you have a, again, it's not easy to animate cartoony work. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, to me, compared to realistic animation, it's easier because of the more fluid, not fluid nature, but the, the, the arcs and just the stylization and what you can get away with in terms of minimal animation where you have the holds and blah, 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 blah. Where it is massively more challenging is the performance and the acting. Because every time you do something in an animated movie, it's a character acting. And it has to be believable. It has to be the truth in terms of the moment. And it has to be an acting choice that has never been seen before. And that to me is massively more difficult than realistic animation. So to me, each of them have their easier and harder, quote unquote, elements. Um, so if and then to answer the long answer, to answer your question, um, this style is going to dictate your body mechanics and how you go about that is you probably will need some reference or at least act it out so you know how it feels. So how to animate it is that is you have to look at well, what for realistic animation, these are your parameters. It has to look that way. So your process is going to be a certain way. And for cartoon animation, there's going to be a certain process to make that work in terms of stylizing and pushing the line of action and just the pose and making it clear. Because in, in live action, we can get away with a bit more model silhouette because it's more real, right? That's the easy way. Whereas in, for, in, in feature animation, it's less easy. You have to make it clear while not being too simple. Anyway, it's a long, it's a longer Q and A about stuff like that, about the pros and cons and stuff. But how would that make sense? Probably not. Like, this is a stupid Q and A. All right, Abdul Fahim, which I feel like you've commented a, a couple of times on my channel. I don't know. Seems to be a regular. If you are, thank you. Hi JD, hope you're doing well. I, I'm doing very well. I've been researching on creatures lately. Why creature animations are animated in perspective for camera rather than animating in the camera? Even in VFX, you have fixed plate which works like camera, right? This one I need a clarification and he said in TV production people mostly use camera view for posing they avoid perspective as much as possible to save time looks like you generally use perspective to pose um, yeah it's an interesting question and I think this comes down to I guess to workflow like I I wouldn't be able to animate just the camera I want to go around and 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 tumble around to see is my character cheated is the weight off is the balance right also because of and like during the daytime job, like it's, things have to be real because you know they're gonna add muscle sim and cloth sim and and all kind of simulations and and posing all that stuff. If I cheat it and break the model, there's gonna be always problems somewhere downstream. So I, in my workflow, I definitely pose to camera because I want it to work well towards what we're looking at. But I always kind of look around in perspective mode to make sure it's it's working okay. I don't have the freedom to cheat too much, but. I mean, if you're faster not going into the perspective camera at all and checking things, good for you. Um, and if it doesn't cause any problems, the pipeline with people after you in terms of, you know, people get to render and add things and stuff, uh, then why not? You know, I mean, if you cheat something and, then the, and there's a shadow that reveals the cheat, it's a problem. 
But if none of that happens and you're okay with that, um, I would say it's just then a matter of workflow. And as long as you don't complicate things for other people, uh, I don't know, then go ahead. I mean, I, I use the perspective camera to check on things. I don't know, it's just me. Aaron Miras, Aaron Miras, I think so, maybe, names. First, thanks for the Q&A, you're very welcome. Do you think the soundtrack is key to elevate the animation? I have seen people that doesn't value the music and I have others that aren't related to animation in specific, okay? What is your favorite Star Wars movie and in which of them you had the most fun working on it? And last, which is your all-time favorite film? <laughs> the questions go all over the place, I love it. Uh, let's start with, do you think the soundtrack is key to elevate the animation? Uh, yes. Yes, I mean, I like sound design, I like music, like I like that stuff and, and I don't watch a movie silently. Um, so I want it to be on, it's like games, like I don't, even, even mobile games, I have the music on, the sound, it's part of the game. I don't, I'm not gonna play games, no music and no sound, I don't know, it's not my thing. Um, and in terms of music to elevate, like as you work, like I also listen to things a ton when I, when I either music or movie when I, when I animate, just because it puts me in a certain mood for action things or something a bit more dramatic or whatever it is. And actually right now you can see it's blurry, but where's my finger right here? Oh, this is Dune, the old one, the Lynch. I mean, the new one is not out yet. I can't watch it, but uh, I always have something playing. Usually something I, I'm familiar with. I don't want to play something I haven't watched yet because then I'm distracted, I'll watch that. So it's something that's familiar, but there's always something there. So does it elevate? Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. Yes, subjectively. Um, I love music and, and sometimes music is so cool that it's like its own character in the movie. And if you've seen, or anybody's seen uh, Midnight Run, it's an older movie with uh, uh, Charles Grun, is it Charles Grun? And Robert De Niro is in it, uh, and many other awesome people. And it's it's just, it's such a great movie. And the music's by Danny Elfman. And it's such a specific score that's just its own character. It's so good. Um, so yeah, I definitely value music a lot. And I have another that aren't related to animation specific. Uh, hold on, and people don't value. Yeah, some people don't care. Some people play games without the sound on, and you know, it's whoever. Whatever floats your boat, why not? What is your favorite Star Wars movie? Um, uh, and I, same, I answered the same thing last week and I landed on Empire Strikes Back. Uh, I still really like that movie. That being said, I think you will disagree with each movie, obviously. Like each fan has, uh, quote unquote fan, sometimes people are a bit too aggressive for things. Um, they will have certain views on things, right? Like actually just a Twitter thing that I replied to that I probably shouldn't have. Um, I just got a notification about that where someone was complaining about the Naboo Starfighters in the last movie and they should have been more prominent, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and it was late. It's the last thing I looked up before going to bed. I was like, yeah, I agree. And sadly, people, a lot of likes on that tweet. I don't want to come across as, as negative. The thing is, like each movie has something that I like a lot. Like even though I have favorites where I prefer the classic trilogy over the prequels and even over the newer ones to some degree. The classic trilogy is what I grew up with, and I prefer them versus the special edition of, of the classic versions. But again, it's because of nostalgia and I grew up with, and that's just, I have so many memories of watching those movies. So that's why I still end on uh, Empire, even though A New Hope is really good. And the space battle in Return of the Jedi is still unbeatable. It's still to me the, my favorite space battle in all movie history. It's so great. But as a whole, I think Empire is just really, really cool. That being said, I more or less like the prequels. I mean, I worked on the third one. There's a certain memory of that. But over time, they have grown. Some things have gotten worse. Some things have gotten better. I feel like uh, Phantom Menace is the most Star Wars of the prequels. And there's some really cool elements. I mean, I always like Darth Maul and the pot racer uh, sequence. It's just, but some stuff has just gotten better. And it's just also more daring in terms of new locations and things. That, there's some, some things you can't, you know, completely disregard in the prequels. There's some really good stuff in it. Um, and of the new ones, like I'm really big fan of, of Kylo Ren and Rey, that storyline and that whole beginning on, on uh, Force Awakens until they leave Jakku, like that is just, that whole beginning is really cool. That whole fly, there's some really cool stuff in the new ones as well. Um, so I don't know, I, my favorite is still Empire, uh, even though there's some really good elements in the new ones. And even though I would have preferred some more prequel elements shown in the, in the newer movies to kind of tie the whole thing together, uh, it still works. But I also have to say, I really, really like Rogue One. I'm just a massive, it's really high up there. I'm just, over time, it gets better and better. It's just, I love the characters, the story's cool. Uh, the renders, I'm biased, it's, I work at the company, but uh, I think ILM did a really great job in terms of the look and the renders, it just looks so good. Also Solo, same thing, I think it looks really good. <clears throat> also the cinematography on Rogue One and uh, Solo, I think it's great. I love the actors. <clears throat> 
I think Solo is really good and I'm bummed there's not a sequel because I really like that movie. So I don't know, it's all very subjective in terms of like Empire um, and most fun working on them. It's a tough one just because I'm still kind of gravitating towards episode three because it was my first movie. It's there's so much, I, you know, from Switzerland moving to America, graduating, you know, you, you know, go through reject reels, but then you have your job and it, it works out. And I'm still a fan of Star Wars. And to have your first movie be Star Wars, that is just a massive memory. That's it's just so cool. And even though I prefer other Star Wars movies, I think there's so much that comes with working on that project in terms of. Being at ILM, at the old ILM, this, the San Rafael version, and the people there and meeting, you know, like seeing people that you only know from making offs, like a Dennis Mew and Ben Burr, George Lucas, they're suddenly there. It's just, there's so much that went into working on that movie um, that is hard to beat. That being said, massive fond memories of um, Force Awakens just because there was a big gap. And then there's a new one, new director, new designs. Uh, it was definitely, it was so cool to work on it. At the same time, you may or may not agree or disagree with the end product, but I always have a really good time working on Star Wars movies. I have to say, I just finished uh, recently, <coughs> worked on um, Star Wars Squadrons, just briefly. I just got onto the show for a couple of weeks and ran off. But even that, I just like animating Star Wars vehicles and camera work and stuff like that. I just, I'm just a big fan of it. I'm bumping around things, I'm moving my legs. <clears throat> but yeah, so yeah. I think episode three is still there, even though Force Awakens is really high up. Also, you're saying movies here, but we got to mention The Mandalorian. I mean, holy moly, I'm such a fan of The Mandalorian. I think it's so good. So good. I mean, it's, it, it eclipses many movies. It's still not better than Empire, mainly because Empire is awesome and also nostalgia. But man, I, I'm such a fan of The Mandalorian. And also, <clears throat> can't really talk about it, but what I've seen from season two, <laughs> it's so good. See, even my dog barks. He's, he's totally agreeing. Uh, Mandalorian, so good. Also, which is your all-time favorite film? Can't really answer that. Depends on the mood. Um, and I, sometimes I ask my students that. I'm like, what's your favorite movie? And it's such a stupid question. Not that you're stupid saying. It's just a hard question to answer because there's so many different, you know, like, like Shawshank Redemption. I'm a massive fan of that movie. India agrees. But it's not like a movie that I would watch every day. Like there's some movies like Midnight Express. It's a tough movie to watch. It's really good though, but it's not going to watch. I'm not going to watch a movie every day. Uh, I really like Demolition Man. I can listen. I listen to that movie a ton when I work out. It plays in the background. But favorite movie, if I have to really pick one, it's like Strand on this on a deserted island. Empire is really high up there. I think Raiders of the Lost Ark is really good. I have to say this probably. But then Back to the Future is also really good. And then you know, then you say, okay, well, Ghostbusters is also really good. But then you look at newer ones like The Incredibles, really good. The first Incredibles, oh, so good. Toy Story 2, oh, Monster Sync, I love Monster Sync. Uh, and then the recent one, Spider Verse, so good. Again, it's just, I have a tough time picking an all time favorite movie. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Raiders? Yana Jones one is still really good though. Anyway, this is a long answer. No one cares about any of this. <clears throat> Andrian Becker, Andrian, Andrian Becker. Have you ever received feedback on your work that made you feel like a horrible animator? I remember that one. What was the feedback? Uh, I can't tell you the feedback because this is going to be more work related and I can't, I'm not going to talk about work and client stuff and I can't, this is, I'm going to get fired for this. Um, but to ask, to answer your question in a roundabout way, no. I haven't received feedback that made me feel like a horrible animator. Mainly because, you have to look at it this way. I got hired at ILM, so clearly someone at ILM thinks I'm okay. So maybe over time, I'm I'm a worse animator. <laughs> I get lazy and things are not as good. But the thing is, again, I go to the initial thing of I got hired there, so I, my animation must be at a certain level for them to be okay with me working there. You know what I mean? I can't be a horrible animator and work there. I'm not saying I'm a great anime. I'm just saying I'm good enough to work there. Let's put it this way. People, you know, close their eyes like, yeah, let's hire this JD guy. So that's a distinction there. You're also saying receive feedback that made you feel like a horrible anime. There's a distinction there. <clears throat> you definitely, sometimes you get comments that potentially question your skills, but to me, it's not, 
This is super subjective. I don't get that from, from people who give me comments, mainly because sometimes you might get comments that might sound harsh, but you don't know the place that that person is in, be it, be it a client, again, I can't talk about work, but you know, client or a lead or a suit, whatever. They might have had some terrible news that morning and then everything that they're saying that that day is just, you know, through that lens and you know, you just don't know where, you don't know people's struggles, right? You just don't know where people are in in their life. So whenever I get comments, I look out, okay, let me just filter this whole thing. What do they really mean? And what do I need to take out of this to make the shot better? <clears throat> I think where feeling like a horrible animator comes in is more, is more self-imposed where I feel like this is taking me way too long or I show something and the reaction, not the feedback, but the initial reaction is not a, wow, this is awesome. We're like, okay, well, how about you work this, this, and this? It's more like, mm, I, I failed to make it a wow moment or something that blows them away, or I'm taking way too long to get there. So to me, it's more like, like imposter syndrome, self-imposed doubts and things that, that question my, my skills as an animator. I don't think, I don't take it from other people um, because again, like you never know, like, especially again, can't talk about clients, but you have to understand when, when you work for someone and someone is a, a director, whoever is in charge, giving you notes, I'm not, I don't know what, what that it's like, you know, like you have speaking of Star Wars, you know, like you might not like a movie, but it's a massive responsibility to make that movie work. And the pressure of the fans, the pressure of the studio, the pressure of, of the history of those, <clears throat> of those movies, what came before, <clears throat> there are so many elements that, that add to the pressure and the responsibility of making a movie work. And then if it's, you know, the production, the post-production, <clears throat> maybe a merchandise, actors' wishes, the editing process, like all those things I have, I've never directed a movie. I don't know how this feels and how, how taxing this is in making this work. So whatever feedback I'm getting from, from a person that has all of that in their world at that point, I'm not gonna fault them for being super excited, not excited, angry, Whatever the, whatever the ways they present the feedback. You know what I mean? Obviously you would like the feedback to be nice and, and cushy and like, oh, thank you, you're great, but that's just not the real world. So if, if any of you are watching this and you're getting your, you just start at the company and you're dealing with directors or whoever, like whoever is in charge, could be a marketing director, could be a client editor, whoever gives you notes. Just remember that you don't know that person. You don't know what state they're in, what's going on in their life. And just take that feedback and filter what you need to get out of that feedback to make the shop better. I think you will also save yourself a lot of headaches and frustrations and emotional whatever reactions to whatever you're hearing. So to me, I, I, my Swiss nature goes into play where I'm very neutral about the feedback that I get. If a person doesn't like my work, it's not a critique of me as a, as a human. It's like they don't like the work. It's just not working for them at that moment. Maybe someone else likes what I just did, but it doesn't work for the person who needs it. So then you just adjust to make it work. I don't, I'm not that super precious about the feedback that I'm getting. I don't know. I don't know. hope that helps. Again, I don't know if this helps. Savior, Savior H. I don't know. It's a long question here, expanding. How do you get the time for personal projects or personal small animations? Is that even possible or one you're hired in a studio, you don't have the time for that? It's okay to feel sad because you can't do this is a question. Is it okay to feel sad because you can't do your own projects because there is no time or energy. I just remember this one. It's a great question. Um, and I believe that was the last question that I answered last time. So I want to end it there as well. Yes, that was the last one. Is there a couple things I want to talk about this here? So how do you get the time for personal projects or personal small animations? I don't. <laughs> if you uh, if you look at my uh, my website and the last one was the uh, uh, I'm walking here, the pigeon test. This was a test. And I only animated this because it was for school, because I was teaching a class to help uh, a friend of mine for a short project. And that class was a, a rigging, not the rigging, it was a testing a rig class in a way where the rigs are ready, the two test animations to kind of stress test the rigs. And I remember the, the, the direction for the students was, hey, can you just do a flight takeoff and landing so we can kind of test the wings and stuff like that. And I remember the students not being super enthusiastic about this. Um, because they didn't think it was something interesting to do. And funny enough, I'm usually trying to be supportive in, with the students and what they do. And I remember this one of the few classes, if not the only one, where I was a bit harsher in the feedback, where, and I still regret this. If anyway, anybody was in that class watches this, I apologize. Because it was a thing of, basically the gist of it, I'm generalizing, but it was kind of the, I, the, the, the feeling that, I, that I, I think gave off was, 
well, you sign up for this class if you don't like it, leave type of thing, where like this is, you know, this is, we're re testing the rigs, this is what you got to do. And their argument was like, well, I'm paying for this class. I want to get something out of this that will help me get a job for my real blah, blah, blah. So I understand their point of view absolutely. And I feel like I, I didn't respond in, the, in a good way in that class. And I tried to be more empathetic about what they need. And to go back to your question, the reason why I did the, the pigeon clip is to show them, well, it may sound boring, takeoff landing, very bottom mechanics driven or just testing a rig, but you can do something fun with it, quote unquote. I mean, it's very subjective. I had fun animating it and and, and I, I hope people watch that clip like it, but that is the last time I did things. And I believe that's like five years ago, four, five, six years ago. Um, and since then, I haven't really sat down at home to do my own clip, mainly because I have I had to teach, I think I'm teaching more right now, I'm teaching more than before, but I just have more stuff going, more, more things around me in terms of teaching. Um, the channel takes up definitely more time. Um, I have a side project I can't talk about just yet uh, that also takes time. And also I just wanna take time with my family. It's just, if I animate at home, it's going to be at the expense of something else. Because the thing right now is that, like the reason why I'm teaching, the reason why I'm doing all that stuff too is that when I was a student, I did that cold call email thing of, I Googled the emails like at ilm.com, at pixar.com. And I found a couple emails and I emailed all of those people. And the way I remember, it's probably not true, but the way I remember is that everybody responded. And that had a really lasting impression to me because they're busy, they're working at Pixar, they're working at ILM, and they took the time to look at my my stupid bad work. And I remember one, and I, I mentioned in the Q&A before, I'm not gonna retell that story, but. I, I sent multiple clips to someone as a, a way for that person to choose. Because my thought was, they're probably seeing the same clips. Let me just send him three of them. I don't know, three or four, three probably, so that they can choose. And I think in my writing, it was very clumsy and, and the animator thought that I wanted feedback for all of them. So the, the, the reply was a bit frustrated on his end. Like I said one and you give me three, like what the hell type of thing. It's not what he wrote, but that was kind of the feeling. And I felt really bad. But the long story is that, or the, the short end of that long story is that he still critiqued all three shots. And it was, I think, a page per shot. And that just blew my mind. It's like, first of all, you know, it's I wasn't quite respecting what he was saying. I didn't do it on purpose. I wanted to obviously give him only one shot. Anyway, long story. But what lasted, the last impression was that someone took the time to help me. And they didn't have to. And it was ex really good help. And I probably got a job because of that person. Because of all the people either who separately gave me feedback or that person through the email or the teachers at school. Like none of these people have to do any of this, but it just, I want to be able to pay forward. And this, I'm not saying this to be all self-serving, like, look at me, I'm great because I'm helping people. It's not, it's not that, it's just, I know that I am in a position where I am able to, to hopefully provide something that's helpful for people who might not have access. Not that I need the screen on here, but I have that thing that can do this here. Um, so that the stuff on my channel is free on purpose because you are potentially in a country where you don't have the means to travel to the States or wherever to get to a learning material that is presented there. I mean, like there's some classes where they're only on site. Now with, with, the, with the pandemic, you have more online stuff, which is helpful. But some schools obviously are just on site. Maybe you can't get there. And, and it's also, I mean, I'm doing all my stuff in English. I'm Swiss, my mom is French. I could do my channel in Swiss German or German or French, technically. But I'm still doing it all in English because a lot of animation terms I only know in English, but I'm just used to things in English. I'm saying this because it's also, I, I, I could do better in a way of presenting things in multiple languages or, or adding subtitles. I added subtitles for one shot and it was a, such a pain. It took so, so long, but I could technically add subtitles at least in German and French. The honest answer is I'm not doing this because it takes so much time. But I should technically to, to make the, the material more accessible. Because the thing is, everything I'm doing is in English. A lot of material online is in English. Well, many people don't speak English and they don't have the means. They can't go to the school. The school doesn't teach English. They don't have the financial means to, to learn that stuff in the, in the way it's presented to, or have access to that because it's all in English. So that's already a barrier. My longer is a long answer, but my my answer to all this is that is I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to teach as much as I can because of like my dad paid for school. The academy is super expensive. He paid for everything, right? That's already a step forward. 
a, a further step that many other people can't afford that school. So I feel like I have benefited from obviously help financially from the people who email me their, their work uh, or their feedback. And I want to pay forward. I want to be able to help as well for people who don't have access to the things that I have access to or the means that I was given. And this is why I'm doing this. And the thing is, I could animate, to go back to your question, I could animate at home, but that means I need to take time away from something. So either it's time for my family, which I'm not going to do. Time from work, obviously I can't. I get laid off because I'm not showing up for work. Uh, or teaching, right? Like I, I have a ton of video games. And I don't really play them. I play them with my little one because it's, you know, I can play with him and it's funny stuff like Ring, Ring Fit. We play a lot of Mario Kart, Kirby, like a lot of Nintendo stuff that he can play. We play Spider-Man and it's a lot of fun playing with him. But I did buy Last of Us 2 and I haven't played it yet. I did pre-order the Squadrons and I did get it at Hoda's. It's back there. It's like a massive joystick there. And I do want to play this in VR and I'm probably going to take time. I took time to play Half-Life Alex, which was awesome. I'm like 80% down, 90% down. I haven't finished it yet. But again, I have to take time and stuff will suffer. And I don't want to take time away from teaching because I either I can sit down and play video games, that's selfishly for me, or I can teach and do things and take or teach class or do stuff from my channel where I can pay forward and help people. And right now, I'm still in the mindset where I want to do this. Maybe at one point, I'm going to be tired of all of this and not going to do any of this and stop teaching. And then I'll go back and play all my video games, do music and music, uh, watch my movies and stuff, and uh, do personal projects. I think that might definitely happen at one point. Um, what I do want to do is I do want to get back into doing personal stuff so that I can record the process of it so that I can put that on the channel. Because a lot of people are asking, hey, can you do a demo about like reference we just talked about? Or how has your blocking process? Or how is your blocking to um, polish process? All that good stuff. And that would be a reason for me to go back. But as I said before, it's very time consuming, but I do want to do it. So I will go back to doing personal projects, but it is going to be in terms of serving the channel and the classes so I can have material for people to learn from if it's helpful at all. Um, but just sitting down and doing something for myself. There's one thing I really want to do and I haven't started yet. Again, I don't have time, but there's stuff that would be really cool to do it. So I will try. Is that even possible? Again, uh, I'm not doing anything. Let's put it this way. It's such a weird, long, rambly answer. I try to do everything. I get up really early in the morning. Right now, I'm a bit more relaxed around 6 to 7 a.m. Depending, I have a Q&A this morning at 6 a.m. So I get up early, but I used to get up at quarter to five and I will do that again soonish because I do like that because I get everything done in the morning. In the evening, I'm tired and I want to spend time with my family, my wife, and I'm, I'm less motivated to do anything in the evening. So I'm trying to cram everything in into the morning, maybe in the evening, mainly because during the day, it's I work at ILM, so it's ILM work. I don't want to do anything else besides ILM clearly because it's my day job. So I want to, I have kind of like a schedule so that it allows me to do things that are personal or uh, teaching in the morning. Then I do work related stuff. And then at lunch, I exercise because I've been going on for way too long, just eating and not exercising. And I work a lot, so I need. I, I like that balance of exercising a lot and and working a lot. Um, I should probably do less of either, but of both. So right now it's I work nine to twelve, and I exercise twelve to one, and then get back to work until whatever six seven whatever the schedules of work. And then in the evening I do something else. So do you have time? I definitely have less time. If I had no day job, obviously I would have a lot more time, and I would probably animate a lot more at home for sure. And is it okay to feel sad because you can't do your own projects? And you have no time or energy. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I think I'm. I don't feel sad. I don't. It's not. I'm not, I'm not getting emotional about it. Where because it's a choice. I'm choosing not to do that because I don't want to take away from something else. If I do something, it's always going to be at the expense of something else. And right now, my, my priorities are the family, obviously work and teaching, and, and and trying to help people if I can. And I hope any of this is helpful. Again, like my, my weird Q and A answers. Um, so I could play video games. I could do more, watch more movies. I could, um, you know, do my own personal animation. But if I'm going to do any of that stuff, I'm going to try to use that in a way and fold it into something that will be productive and helpful for someone else. So right now, when I watch movies, I take notes all the time. That's for my Thursday act analysis and tips for animators. Plug it. It's good. I like it. You should watch it. Um, but I do that. So when I watch this, it's also for me uh, to enjoy the movie. 
but I know I can use this. A, it helps me a lot in my work. Um, it's, it's not just for teaching, it's, it helps me a ton. I see things differently and I feel like I have better ideas and just my workflow has gotten better in terms of ideas and doing things. Um, and uh, hopefully, and, and it's it's a somewhat neglected playlist on my channel. I'm gonna push this as much as I can. You should watch it because I think it's really helpful in terms of idea and, and finding and creative springboard and starting to do something. Um, so that way, I, now I can fold in movie and TV watching for the channel. And if I do something to answer your question, personal stuff, it's definitely tricky. But if I'm going to do something, I want to make it so that it's something I can put on the channel, which then again makes it more labor intensive where I can't just, I'm not going to just sit down and animate now. Oh, that's cool. It's going to be, all right, let me sit down, screen capture the whole thing, make sure I don't waste time noodling around because I want it to be focus it or people who watch this will get something out of it and not just watch me half an hour think about a shot. So it's 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 already a bit more processy labor because of the end result that I wanted to cut it up and put that into a lecture or something or a course or on the channel. Um, so moving forward, I'm going to try to do that. Such a non-answer to your question. Anyway, I have like two minutes left on this. That's every half hour my Sony camera stops. Um, but this is an hour again, like last time. And I, I covered all the questions like last time. So yeah, I'm leaving it at that. So will I ever go back to animating something uh, on my own? I really would like to. Every time I do something where we talk about shots with students and they show me their things and we kind of brainstorm, uh, so many times I end up going, man, I wish I could just stop this class right now, take your shot and animate it at home and do your shot. Because it just gets me pumped to talk about ideas and see people's work. And, and I, I, I'm saying I come home, I'm home now all the time. but. I do definitely have a massive urge of animating my own things. And I do still take notes and write down ideas on my, my private reference blog thingy where I collect all those ideas. I definitely have a lot that I wanna do, but I'm not doing it because it would be at the expense of something else. If I wouldn't be doing my day job, yes, I would do it just because to hold my skills and keep my demo reel up to date. But I do animate at work, so I still get my daily animation fix because I love animating. So I also don't see a massive need. I only have one minute left. Of course, if I get laid off, I will definitely go back and animate my own thing to round out my reel and do something else and cartoony things. And oh, you know, there's always like my current situation doesn't necessitate to do what you'd ask me to do. Uh, you didn't ask me anything. You asked me if I do animate uh, at home and if my day job lets me. It doesn't really time wise go blurry here. Um, but yes, I got 40 seconds left anyway. I'm gonna leave it at that. This is a massively long Q&A, but I will go through all of the questions. All of them will be answered with multiple clips. If you're actually watching this, listening, thank you so much. This is the end. Subscribe if you want to. I do all kinds of things on the channel. So maybe there's something of, of, of help or something you might like. I do upload stuff almost every day, pretty much. So subscribe so you don't get any, any uh, missed uploads. And that's that. The 12 seconds left. Thank you.